So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to read all the way through verses 6. Is that okay? Okay, you ready? Okay, let's read. Just follow me, okay? Don't read all loud. Okay, it says, The elders who are among you, I can't see, I exhort, I who I am a fellow elder, the witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, by willingly, not for this honest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lord over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Amen? The end of the service. <laughs> this is going to be the shortest service you're going to get. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, looking at this passage is very obvious. You know, um, in the beginning, it seems that it's talking to me first. It seems that way. And it is in the, in the beginning of the, the verses. It seems like it's talking to me. Uh, and, you know, and it's probably the truth. It, you know, being a pastor, it's not easy. You know, it's good. It's very good to be a pastor, but it's also very painful. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that, but it is. And one of those, those reasons are because, you know, we, we, we want to be... We want to be truthful for what we believe. So when it comes to humility, when I was, you know, um, I don't know how can I pull this, but in my life as a pastor, it's been a very painful process when it comes to humility. I'm going to read some verses, you know, later on so you can understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say. But it's very obvious that, you know, it's talking to me first, and it's saying, you know, be careful how you treat the flock. And it's true because, you know, being a pastor, being up here, you know, having a, a pulpit and being in charge in a sense, it's very easy that you can use this thing to be power, overpower people or to be rich or to be making a name for yourself. But when it comes to humility, like we read right there in the end of the verses, it's addressing everybody, you know, not just me, but also you. And this is what I found out, you know, in my life growing up, and as a pastor, as a Christian in the United States, um, then when I look around society, one of the things that I see that, I, that we are really far from it is humility. Humility. What is humility? I know there's a lot of teaching about humility. Believe me, I, when, when I was praying about the service, when they asked me, I mean, when they told me, <laughs> they said, you're doing the service and it's going to be this service. Bob's going to be watching probably. <laughs> but I said, oh, God, now what? What are we going to do? Because <laughs> it's hard for me, you know, because I had to be talking, but God speaks to me in Spanish. I go, this is the time you have to, you have to speak to me in English. I need to translate everything in my head. So the number one thing that came to my heart was humility. You know, so I went, I went and searched humility, and it's a lot of stuff about humility, and I just put it to the side because I was like, totally freaking out. Go, this is a lot of information about humility. I'm just going to go pray and ask God to help me. So he, he's the one that, you know, was showing me the verses. So when we look at the society, this is what we see, lack of humility everywhere. Why? What did, he, what did that mean, being humble? What does that mean? Seriously. And it seems like people do not understand you know, what humility means. But it doesn't mean being poor, that's one thing. Neither means to think less about yourself. And we are huge in the United States about self-esteem, isn't it? Self-esteem. Look at the word, self. It's all about you. 
God is working on killing you. Especially your pride, yourself. And this is what I see, you know, when I look at the society. is the lack of humility. It seems to me that not only they don't understand it, but they don't even want to come close. It seems like humility is something that is weak, that is cowardly. What we, what we do every day, you know, I was not with our mouth, but with what we do, what, you know, every day we proclaim that we are so made men. You can see all over, all around you. But in, in, in this, uh, if, you, if you read your Bibles, I mean, I don't know if you uh, read the Old Testament. We're going to go to the Old Testament in a, little, in a little bit. But when you look at the Old Testament, and the New Testament also, when you were trying to you know, discover who God is, you found really quickly that God is disgust. I mean, he said that he hates pride so bad. When you go back in the Bible and read Proverbs in chapter 6, it states, you know, in the, it says, you know, this is a 17 that he hates, 16 is abomination to him. And the number one is pride. And yeah, that's a common thing every day now in our culture, society, as we live life daily. It's a common thing. What is humility? This is what that's that's my this is my definition of humility, okay? But this is the best one <laughs> because I leave that out. I, I try to do that every day. It's it's not easy. It is not easy. We're gonna look some passages, you know, and, and other scriptures, and I want you to really, really uh, focus on this and meditate. But humility for me is actually to think nothing about yourself, nothing about yourself. You will say, yeah, right. Why? How do we, when we all go around in our circles of friends and people and church, what is the way that we present ourselves? How is the, what do we do? What is the first thing we do? We identify ourselves with our titles, isn't it? I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a plumber, whatever. But what God says, we have to become humble. In verse 6, is something I want you to keep in mind. They said, therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Humility means bring your nothingness to God. For what? We will see, some, we will see something there in, 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 the, in some of the verses. But I want you to, I want you to uh, don't forget this. Okay? You can write it down if you want. But this is humility. It's bringing your nothingness to to God, and he would do something with it. It's actually the first step. When it comes to educating yourself about God, this is your, your first step. Humility, if you don't know, if you don't understand, if you don't, uh, or if you don't live it out, everything else will not make any sense. And, and, and humility is just like uh, being patient. You know, when people say, hey, can you pray for me for patience? Really? You want me to pray for you for patience? Are you ready? Because you, you will not learn that stuff in the book. You won't even learn humility in a sermon like right now. You know, you have to live it out. And all I want to give you this morning is something that has worked for me, and I believe that will work for you because it's the Word of God. It's two ways to become humble that I know in the Bible. Two ways. So I'm gonna, I want to look those two ways with you this morning. The first one is over in, uh, Deut- I can't pronounce the word. Help me out. Deuteronomy? <laughs> That's the way you say it, Deuteronomy? Ah, okay, well, there you go. Go, go. go there in chapter 8, okay, real quick. <laughs> Listen to what God has to say about the way that we can be humble. Man, I'm so hot right now. I'm going to take this off. <laughs> Is that okay? Okay. I'm so nervous. That's why. That's why I have my wife. Ah, feels better. You're feeling heavy. 
All right, uh, Deuteronomy. Um, this book is, you know, um, just real quick. I don't know if you read it before, but the, the, the word in itself means the second law or the repetition of the three last books, okay? So God is repeating the law to the Israelites. Uh, and uh, in, in this chapter 8, you know, he's, he's giving them, he's told, he, he told them about the past and then now the present and then, and then he will address the future. But here, he's, he, what he's doing in chapter 8, in some of this chapter, he's, he's telling the people... Principles to pour to practice to be to be able to live life, okay, the Christian life. So I want you to put that in mind because a lot of the people will go to this passage and say, "Hey, this is addressing the law," and and it is true because he's talking to the Israelites back then for that for those guys at that moment. But I want you to know this: when it comes to the heart of God, is the same. When it comes to the principles of God, are the same. Okay, it's not so much the the, the, the law, the letter, but it's the spirit behind the letter. You understand what I'm saying? We still have to do the law. Not to be saved. Jesus didn't take it away, did he? No. So, you know, so when we read this passage, know this. It's the principle, it's the spirit behind the message what God is saying in this passage. I don't want you to just exclude it. Like just put it out just because it's, it's about the law. I mean, think about it. Go back. I mean, if you go to Matthew, when, it, when Jesus is repeating some of this stuff, he said, and the law said, do not commit adultery, right? Is it true? So what are we supposed to do? Are we not under the law? So what are we going to do? Are we going to do less or are we going to do more? It seems like Jesus, what, what he did, he raises the bar higher. He said, but I say to you, if you look at a, a woman lasting over her, you already committed adultery in your heart. You women also do the same thing. So don't look at me weird like. <laughs> you do. When someone is lasting over you, you start walking all differently. <laughs> right? You start throwing your hair to the sides. <laughs> it's the same thing. You're lasting over that person that is lasting over you. So it goes by, it's the same thing, okay? All I'm saying, that's not my point, okay? Let's go back to <laughs> chapter 8. Listen, this is one of the ways that you actually become humble. Look at what it says in verse 2. I'm going to read verse 2 and 3. But I want you to read with me because um, it's hard for me, okay? And you should remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man should not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. See what I'm saying? You heard of the passage about if my people will humble themselves and pray? You heard that before? Sometimes, you know, we say the passage, we quoted the passage, and we don't understand the context behind it. But the passage, God is saying, you know, if you go back, I think it's in uh, Second Chronicles, right? Chronicles? Chronicles, Second Chronicles. Rah, I'm telling you, it's in the Bible, somewhere ahead after after this book. If you read it, you you see the um, what they're doing. The, the King Solomon, he's dedicating the temple, and then the, they, they they do some offerings and stuff, and God is showing up. Actually, the the glory of God, that thing that I just told you about the Shekinah. Actually, you can read it there. The she, she, not Shikana, the Shikina glory came down, comes down in the temple. Uh, but anyways, God is, is just you know dealing with His people. But in, in the passage, when it said before, when it says, "But my people humble themselves," it's also saying before that that He said, "If I bring you calamity, if I bring you to hunger, what is that? What is He saying? If I bring, if I take away 
all your needs, if I take away your, your provision, daily provision, and, then, and on top of that, I'll bring your calamity over you, then if you humble yourself and pray, you know, the people that's called by my name, then I will heal your land. All he's saying is that he will do these things for one reason, because he want to bring you back to, to himself. That's the, that's, the, that's the context about the, the passage. So here it's saying, one way to be humble. It says right here, that he humble them. How? Do you remember the story back in Exodus? Think about it. Forty years they spent in the desert. Do you know the story? Do you know what happened? Really, how long it takes from Egypt all the way to the place that they're supposed to be, you know, the place they were supposed to uh, end up in the promised land? Do you know how long it was, literally, from that place to one point A, point B? Do you know that? It was only like through, um, between 11 and 14 days to get to the, that place. How long it took them? 40 years. Why? 40 years. It says that he did this to humble them. Now, 40 years, if you look at the story, they went through a lot of pain, a lot of stuff. Entire generation dies. So how did he humble them? It says right here in verse 3, it says, so he humbled, it says, so he humble you, allow you to hunger. He took away all the, the provision. He brought the people all the way to a place to depend on him totally. And I believe that this is one way that God does humble his people Especially nowadays, you know, especially the days that we're living in right now. If you look around, um, you don't see much of this. When it says right here, the men should not live by bread alone, it seems the opposite to me when I look my world around me. It seems like men, that, it seems like the existing of men is all about survival. I mean, look at the TV. When we watch the TV, what did, what did they give you? You know, and the commercials and all that between shows and stuff. The, the next new thing, isn't it? it I'm always, you know, I'm always, uh, and I, I, I can become very ju judgmental. If you went to the Black Friday, you, you need to repent. I'll give you a chance in the end. <laughs> I'll give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to go through that a little bit, but... This is just weird, man. I'm like, seriously? Camping for a stupid TV? Wow. I, I just can't fathom. You know, I was coming from Caldwell from visiting some people on, on, on that day. And I see all these cars, you know, from Nampa. Maybe one of you were, <laughs> was there. But I just follow the cars, see where they were going, and actually they went to the mall, right? I'm like, wow. But listen, it's not about survival. You know, that's the thing. If a guy needs to take some of that stuff away, he will take those stuff away to be able to bring you to himself. So he said, hey, allow them to hunger. You ever been humble before in your, uh, before in your life? Did you ever been, been humble? I have. I'll give you one story. <laughs> that's not good. My stories are not that good. But, you know, back in the 80s, yes, I'm old. Uh, in the late 80s, when I finished my junior high, I was really into uh, MC Hammer. You know who MC Hammer is? You do? Seriously? Can't touch this, huh? Knock it off. We're in church. But, no, seriously, I was into the, the, kinda, the dancing thing, the MC Hammer dancing thing. Uh, you, you probably don't believe me now, but I wouldn't show you. Because I would look sick. <laughs> and not like, not sick like the, you know, the, the young kids will say, that looks sick. That means that looks good, right? <laughs> no, that's a dying metaphor. I'm taking like, they will be sick. <laughs> Anyways, I was into that stuff and, uh, you know, like dancing in a comp 
you know, go, go and do, you know, competing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and please, just forgive me if it, if it sounds weird, but I decided not to wear any underwear. <laughs> I know it sounds terrible because you guys are like, who is this guy? What he's doing? What is he doing in the pope? Where's Bob? <laughs> but bear with me. Anyways. So I was doing that, and I decided, I, you know, it's easy for me to change clothes and stuff faster and all that kind of stuff. So, but I came to the United States, and then I got married. But that's not the point. The thing is that I was working, and then I got hurt. And I didn't know how the, the entire system of the uh, United States and the doctors and all that works. I got hurt in my knee. And what did they do when you get hurt in your job? They send you to the doctor because they had to check you, right, for workers come or whatever. Well, I went to the doctor. The problem is, is when she asked me to take my pants off. <laughs> I go, you got to be joking. <laughs> I can leave my, you know, my jeans. And, and he said, no, you need to take your pants off. And I had to let him know. I go, you know, I don't use any... Uh, and yeah, that, I mean, I even embarrassed, I'm married, but I had to be in my clothes in the dark, you know. <laughs> and here I am in front of some stranger. I feel very humiliated. It's humiliating, right? I don't even know the person, you doctors out there. You know how that feels really bad. <laughs> Maybe some of them here, but you do a good job. Anyways, <laughs> I, I know how to be humble, but what about being humbled by God? Have you been humbled by God? You know, there's two ways to be humble. This is one of them. You know, God will humble you. Depends on what you're going through. If God wants you to bring you back to him, he will humble you. It says right here, I humble you, you know, to hunger. It's very obvious. He, he took away those things that are between him and his people. Right? But you've been humbled by God? I have. And it's not pretty. You know, it's very painful. I remember after I became a Christian, a couple of years after that, I was in a men's tree. And we had this thing over there that we call the afterglow. I never get it. I never got it. Why? You know, the afterglow. But it's a time of praying and worshiping and just coming together. And then some guys go, will go to the microphone and will start, you know, saying the testimonies, you know, what God is doing through the retreat or stuff like that. And I was right there and I was praying. I was literally, I was praying and I asked God, I said, God, I want you to humble me. Never again pray that prayer after that. <laughs> and I will not do that again. Okay. I did, but I did it with, with sincere, you know, sincere, sincereness in my heart. I really did. I said, God, I want you to humble me. I want to, I want to know you more. I want to see you more. And, you know, we came down from the retreat, and a couple of weeks later, I forgot about it, what I just said, you know. But a couple of weeks later, I was working in this company. And I don't know if you know, but when you come citizen of the United States, when you're a foreigner, you know, from other country, you have to go through a lot of stuff, a lot of checkup, you know, not only the background, but the physical. And they found this thing in my body, which they thought it was contagious. So they, had, they put me in these treatments, you know, for months. Or else they wouldn't, they wouldn't give me the, the citizenship. So I did. Anyways, I was working at this company, and I was talking to a, uh, one of the co-workers there about my life. And I decided to share that. You know, I, it sounds kind of interesting. They were asking about it, so I just sh share it. But it turns out that this person went up to the, to the office, decided to tell the office, decided to tell the management. And they got scared because what I shared it sounds pretty bad, but it was not bad. Believe me, I'm not going to say it because I don't want to get more trouble anymore. <laughs> but it wasn't that bad. But it, it, she, she, now I said she. I, was, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Anyways, they, the, the office came uh, when I, to the place where I was working at, and, and they said, you know what? We heard these things that happened with you. So we want to know if that's truth. And I said, yes, I said, it, it is truth. And they said, well, I want you to know that unless you bring us some proof that you are okay, you will not be able to work here. And I said, really? He said, yep. 
And not only that, they said, not only you won't be able to work here, but you will not be able to work anywhere in the United States. And we will make sure of that. I go, whoa, that's not good. So I said, and I tried to explain it. I said, no, I'm sorry, we need proof from the treatment that you took. So I said, okay, I'll do that. I, you know, they, they told me, you have to go right now. You have to take your stuff and leave. And so I did. I went into the parking lot, drove, and drove to the hospital. Because that's where I, I took the treatment. I went to the hospital. It's been a few years already. So I went to the hospital, and I, I told them what was happening. They said, okay, let's, let, let, let's, um, let's look for your file and stuff. And I was waiting and waiting, and uh, they couldn't find anything. They c came back and said, I'm sorry. We, we, we can't find any of your files, any of your information. So it's nothing that we can do right now. If we, found some, if we find something in the future, we'll give you a call. And I go, no, no. You know how bad it feels for a man to lose something like that? It's pride, but it still feels bad because I wanted to, you know, to provide for the, for the family. But I remember very clearly coming out of the hospital, I was thinking, if I go try to get another job, I'm a Christian, I'm not going to go lie and say, hey, you know, because they ask you, where do you used to work? You know, where was your previous job? Can we, can, can we call them? Can we talk to them? I can't lie. I have to let them know why I got laid off, why I let go. I got let go. But anyways, I was, I was driving back to the house, and I was in the freeway. I didn't know what I was going to do. And my wife, you know, is, you know, stay home mom, raising my kids. I started praying. I was crying. I was really hurt. And I said, God, I don't understand what's happening, but I want you to, I'm asking you to give me something, guide me. And I never forget his voice very clearly. He, he, you know, I was driving and crying, and he said, remember when you asked me to humble you? Immediately, my heart filled out with, you know, joy. I was still crying. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> I just got fired, you know. It doesn't feel good. And he said, you told me to humble you. And I was dealing with some other stuff. You know, I was dealing with some financial stuff and, and, and not really trusting in God in that area. But he took my provision away to bring me back to himself and to trust in him and everything. Anyways, and he did. And I even said, you know, I was driving. You know, you know we pastor, we, you think that we don't... We are just full of faith. It's not true. You know, I was driving and I, it's just the only thing that I heard it was that you asked me to humble you. And that was it. And I said, and I know it's God, but I said, God, you know, just like Abraham, God, I just want to, I just want to, I just wanted another sign. So I said, God, if that was you, I'm going to go turn around. I'm going to go drive to the, to the church. We do that. I don't know if you do that. I don't do that anymore, but you know. I used to do that a lot because I, I you know, just doubting. But I said, I'm going to go drive to the church, and I want this person to be available for me to talk to, this pastor. And I don't know if you know, but pastor's job is very demand, and it's not easy to get one that is, you know, to talk to one because it's a lot of to do. So anyways, I drove to the, to the church here, to the parking lot, and the guy was standing in the pillars right outside the lobby just looking at the parking lot. And I said, this is very obvious. It got to be God. So I said, okay. I went to the, I went to the guy and said, I, I need to talk to you about something. He said, okay, let's go upstairs. Just like that. And I knew that that, that was God. See? But this is one way to humble you. And you, you might be in that area right now. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with that right now. Maybe some of the stuff has gone away. And now we're going to read some other passages when I want you to really take to, you, take to heart. But this is one way that I don't want to be. And you don't want to be. But it's very obvious that he would do something like that. And it seems to me, you know, you might have a different take on this. But for me, I do believe that God judged the nations even now in some ways. And yeah, we can be humble. We say that we don't want to be humble because of what we do, but we do can be humble. Every time that something happens, so you know, something really bad happens, what do we do? What do we do? Do we really care 
about that truck or that house or that clothes. What happened? We become humble, right? And all we're thinking is about our family and food. To be able to feed our families and to be able for them to be okay. We do know how to humble ourselves. We just don't want to. And we want to see why. But this is one way that we can become humble. But you don't want to be in this place where God will humble you. And it says right here, because men should not live by bread alone. See, life is not about just the flesh, the physical. It's about God, what he's saying. It's about his promises, what he's promises in his word. It's about what he's doing right now. So we don't live by bread alone. The other passage that I'm going to give you, the other way to be humble, is in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, just real quick, there's a story of the Apostle Paul. And just before we go there, just to uh, set the story a little bit, um, just remember this. When we read the Bible, it's obviously we have to know, you know, the context of what we're reading so we understand how to apply it to ourselves. You know, and the things that we learn from the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts is obviously uh, when you look at his life, is the context of his life, what's happening, what happened back then during that time, during the, the Israelites, the Jews. Uh, but it's still, we can still apply it to, to us today. So I want you to know that uh, the other way to be humble is to use your life, to use whatever is happening with you right now, whatever you're going through, you can, you can be doing good. I mean, you can be doing great and, and, and everything, financial, marriage, whatever, your kids are fine. You know, they made their bed without you telling them and all that kind of stuff. But, if, but most of us, most of us, we always, you know, in some type of battle or situations or problems, well, things are happening in our life. But I want you to know that when it says to be humble yourself under the mighty hands of God, it's talking about his power, his control. Under the mighty hand of God means, meaning that to submit yourself to what he already is saying. To use your life as a platform to be able to glorify God himself. Use your life, whatever you're going through, whatever you do, whatever your, your context of your life is every day. Whatever you are, you know, whatever you do, before that, before you are a lawyer, before you are a husband, before you, whatever, you are a Christian, if you are one. Before all that, that's who you are. You are the child of God, and you have to use your life as a platform to be able to glorify God. Paul did that. If you go to chapter 20, in verse, uh, he I don't know if you know much about the book of Acts, but Paul, you know, went to all over the place, all over the region. He went to uh, Asia Minor in uh, Europe and, you know, the Macedonia, Ephesus, Syria, all those kind of uh, places. He went and planted a lot of churches. He was evangelizing. He was, you know, people were coming to Christ. And then he decided to come back to J Jerusalem uh, to do a couple of things. But one of those things, I believe, that he, he was trying to unify the, the Gentile church to the Jews. Because on the way back, you know, he went to visit the churches. He asked the churches to, to pick up an offerings to bring it back to Jerusalem. And the offerings obviously was coming from Gentiles. You know, he was going to go take the money over to, to, to Jerusalem, to the Jews, to show what God was doing in the Gentile churches. And obviously, love of God was there. And by, you know, by showing them uh, through this gift. Anyways, Paul is coming down, going back to Jerusalem. In chapter 20, something he said, it is very, for me, I know that I, I won't be able to say things like this, at least, at least not now. In verse 18, it says, and when they had come to him, on verse 17, 20, he was coming down, says, from Miletus? How do you say that city? Miletus, Miletus, 
He sent, he says, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always live among you. And it says in verse 19 in the beginning, Serving God, the Lord, with all humility. Now you can see that display in the book of Acts. And now we read a, a few things here, but he's coming down. You know, he told the elders of Ephesus what he's all about. And he keeps going back to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, when he gets there, it's something that happened that is very interesting. That for me, I see the humility of Paul using his life to glorify God, to serve God, to bring people to God himself. So he goes on, he gets to Jerusalem, and in, and in, and in, a verse, and in chapter 21, if you go with me in chapter 21, uh, verse 20, 21 also, after he went to Jerusalem, he got there, uh, the elders and James, the brother of Christ, James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, you know, received Paul, with glad, it says right here, you know, they were happy to see him, they were, you know, they started talking about things, and Paul started sharing about what God has been, been doing through his life through his ministry, they rejoice, they glorify God, but something happened. And this is what I want you to see. In verse 21, after all that, they said, But they have been informed. I said, Paul, it's something that is going on that is against you. It's some, it's some you know, rumors going around. And it says, But they've been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying, that they ought not to circumcise the children, nor to walk according to the custom. What then? Paul, what are you going to do? This is what it's been saying about you. You've been teaching the people to go against the law, you know, to go against Moses. What are you going to do, Paul? What do you think of Paul did? I think of Paul just said, hey, I'm the apostle Paul, man. You believe me, not them. What did he do? He humbled himself. If you remember before that, those chapters, they trying to stop Paul to coming down to Jerusalem. They told him that if he goes down to Jerusalem by the Spirit of God, that he will have a lot of battles like this. So he knew. He knew he was submitting himself to the word of the Lord, what was going to happen anyways. So he went on and said, what then? You know, in verse 22, he said, that the assembly must certainly me, for they will hear that you have come. And it goes on, and they told him what to do to be able to restore that credibility towards the Jews in the next verses. So he did. He submitted to that. He told, he told them, I mean, they told Paul to go and do this um, tradition of the, of the temple, you know, purification about some people used to make uh, consecrating uh, vows. That's the right word. They will pull the you know time aside to give themselves totally to God. Meaning, like they will not go to carnes asadas. You know, they will not go to the movies. They won't do any of that stuff. They will completely pull themselves to the side just to serve God. They will call it the Nazarites. So there was four guys there. They were coming in to the end of the vow. And, you know, as a Nazarite, if you, there were some rules that you're not supposed to break. And if you do that, you, you need to go, you needed to go and, and do the, uh, uh, this purification thing. Okay? So that's what's happening in, 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 the, in, the, in here in the story. Uh, they told him, look, you can restore your credibility with the Jews. I want you to go do the same thing with these guys. You know, and not only that, Paul, as you go and take these guys to the temple, you also pay for them. You know, just pay for them. You know, you know sponsor them. They have to pay. Do the offering thing. And this, this, this thing will, you know, last seven days. So if you go down, Paul did all that kind of stuff. He, want, he wanted it to be able to reach out to his own people. He was using his life as a humble man to reach out to his people. And if you go to like 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you will see that he, Paul himself said, I became everything for everybody. He said, I'm a free man, but I became a slave 
to men to gain some of those men. And this is why I, 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 I believe that God put humility in my heart to share with you this morning. This is what we are not doing. Humility. It's using your life, believing in God, believing what he already says in his word, using who you are, what you're doing, to one reason alone. And what is that reason? Because Paul himself said it. It's to be able to reach the people for Christ. And Paul said it, how far, you got, how far you need to go? Far as you need to go, that's the far as you're going to go. To do one thing, to reach people for Christ. So that is what, what he's doing in, in the story. But look at what happened in verse 27. He went and did all that kind of stuff. But in verse 27, it says, Now when the seven days were all, almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd. And laid hands on him. No, they were not praying for him. They were beating him up. Look at what it says in, in verse 28. Crying now, men of Israel, help! What, it, what is happening is they grab him out of the temple. They drag him out. And they yell to, you know, for more people to come and help him. To beat up one man. Say, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. That was true. Is that true? That what happened with Paul? That was all lies. That was false accusations. So here's Paul coming down to his people. Remember, where's the Christians? Where's the church? Where's James? James and the elders, because if you keep reading and for the rest of the book of Acts, Paul goes trial after trial. And if you look at very carefully, very closely, the way that he behaved, the way that he used his attitude as believer, it was very humble. Because everything he did, it was to reach out to the people. Here, they got so mad, they dragged him out of the temple. He went to give him money. To help the church, he went in to you know to do the the thing in the temple to restore the credibility with the Jews to say, look, I'm not against the law. I'm I, I can do these things. See, I'll, I'll do them. He paid for those four guys. And right after the the end of the seven days, what happened? They were not happy. These Jews, obviously religious people, saw him in the temple, and you know for the verse right there, 29 all the way down to chapter 22. Paul gets beat up. It gets so bad beat up that the, that the Romans come in to help him out, you know, take him away from the Jews. And look at what it says in, in verse 40. When he, had, when he get, get, get a chance to speak out, right in the end of the chapter 20, 21, in verse 40, it says, So when he had given him permission, Paul stood up in the stairs and motioned with a hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Look at what happened. 22. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. Wow. Can you imagine after he got beat up by his own people, he gets a chance to speak out. He can easily say, Hey, you vipers. He can easily just, you know, react to what's happening to him at the moment. But what did he do? He still, in his attitude, his humility, he wanted to reach out to his own people. So in the rest of the chapter 22, if you read it all, he started sharing his testimony. He goes on, share the gospel. And all the way to verse 22, it's amazing because after he shares all that, in 21st, it says, Then he said to me, Depart from I will send you far from here to the Gentile. Paul is talking to the Jews, saying that this is what Jesus told Paul to do in his testimony. But what happened in 22nd, it says, And they listened to him and to, the, and to this word. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. you see what's happening here? 
If you go, you know, to the rest of the chapter, to the rest of the book, you see Paul's life over and over again. In humility. And it's amazing because this is what we don't get in. That's, this is what we don't get nowadays, literally, is how to be a, a, a Christian, a, a humble Christian. Because you're not here to, you know, to make name for yourself or to make careers. It's amazing to me to see that you, most of the people waste their times, especially when it comes to parents and their kids. You know, uh, most of their, their conversations or, or, or their, uh, what would you call it, the, the parenting, it's all about education. And the reason I say that because this, this is what I see. This is what I hear every time that I meet people. And when it comes to using your life for the glory of God or for the gospel, it's nothing there. And humility is really far from daily life. Being humble means bring your nothingness to God, meaning you come to God and say, here I am, Lord, I'm, I'm no one, nobody. Use my life. How do you want to use me? Look at what I have. This, look at what I've done. This is my money. This is my car. This is my wife. This is my kids. This is my church. This is my life. This is my city. What do you want to do? That's being humble. Let God use your life for himself. And this is what Paul is doing. If you, if you read the rest of the chapter, I mean the book, you'll see that Paul uh, touched people all over the place. And especially in this situation, he went trial after trial after trial. But you'll see that he preached the gospel not only to the Jews, but to the Romans, to the soldiers, to two governors, you know, to Felix, to Festus, to one king, to Agrippa the king, the Herod Agrippa. And on top of that, he ended up going all the way to Augustus, the emperor. But in between, he preached the gospel to a lot of people because of the humility that he was humbling himself in the situations, whatever God was taking him every day. He also preached to the prisoners, you know, we read. I'm going to read at the end of the story. Look, look with me in the book of Acts in the end. See what I mean. It's amazing because this is the type of people that we need to be when it comes to humility. And I'm not done yet. And I see the clock and I said it was going to be done soon. So let me read uh, verse 23. So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom his plain and solemnly, or solemnly, testify of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. Look at verse 30, 31. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence and no one forbidding him. This is what life is all about. Is knowing, knowing Christ and letting him know to the people. And how? In humility. You have to be humble. I'm going to finish reading before my time is up. Back in the book, <laughs> the Old Testament. You know where. Deuteronomy. I want you to go back with me the same place. So I want you to look at something right here. And this is what I believe, you know, that we need to be humble. There is something that we lack in big time nowadays when it comes to Christian life. I don't think we get it anymore. Look at what God says. He says, I will humble you by doing this. <clears throat> Why? Remember, when it's talking to the, to the Israelites, you know, uh, Egypt is a, is a picture of uh, uh, sin. You know, God brought us from Egypt to the promised land. God brought us from the darkness to the lie. You know, from the life of the bondage of sin to freedom. Right? To the, from the devil to Christ. That's the Christian life. Okay? So listen, listen, listen what he says in verse 11. Let's read verse 11 all the way through real quick. It says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord thy God, or your God, by not keeping his commandment. Just remember what I, uh, let me remind you, remember what I said. 
The principles are still the same. It's the same thing. Yeah, we're not under the law, but the principles are the same. Idolatry, morality, it's the same thing. God is also saying the same thing. So, so put attention at that, what he's saying. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgment, and his statutes, which I commend you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses with Danda and dwell in them, and when you herd and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, we've been there, we have Danda, right? Especially in this nation. Do you know that this is the 5% of the rest of the world? We are so blessed. We build beautiful houses. We just so cry babies all the time. We think that the government needs to be able to fix our problem. But look at what it says right here, verse 14. Hey, shut that up. It's messing me up. When your heart is lifted up, okay, when your heart is gets prideful, look at what it says. And you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, in which were fierce serpents and scorpions in thirsty land, where there was no water, who brought, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your father did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good to the end. But it says, but then you said in your heart, power and might of my hand, I have gained this, me this well. And you should remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get well, that he might establish you his covenants, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. What is he saying? Do you hear what he's saying? We, this is what we have done in our nation today. We have multiplied everything. And this is what we see. This is what, what I see most every day. We don't say with our word, but we say with our life. We say, look, look at how we, look at the things that we have done. Don't we say that when we are watching the politician and they say, hey, we are North, we are Americans. And whatever happened to us, we will rise up. We will rise up better than anything else, I mean, than any other time. And what do we do? Yes! What did God says? No! <laughs> you don't have no power. I have given you all this. It's because of me. You need to be humble. Do not forget about me. That's what he was saying. Let me ask you something. Are you sick of this world? Are you sick of the world? Because we say it all the time, especially when it comes to, you know, putting new people on office and, uh, and, uh, and uh, president stuff. We, you know, it's all over the, the news and the, and the radio, and, and uh, we have to be, you know, put a Christian people here, or put a Christian people over there. Are we sick of the world, seriously? Are you sick of the world? Okay, are you sick of the world? Are you sick of fighting with your wife? Are you sick of living together with you? What, uh, girlfriend or boyfriend? Are you sick of watching pornography? Because a lot of people do. That's why they hide themselves behind those things that we call technology. Are we really sick of the world? Or you only sick of the world when you laugh, le- I mean, you know, your spouse left you, when you lose your job, when you get cancer. Is that the only, the only time that you sick of the world? I want you to know this. God is calling us to be humble people, or he's going to humble us. But we can use our life to be humble, to use it. You know, that thing is really messing me up. Uh, I'm going to go, I want, you to, I, want you, I want to read something really quick um, before we leave, okay? Go, go to Isaiah 50, 57. And this is about being humble. Because we, you know, that's why you're in church. You know, that's why you come to church. You want to know more about God. You want to see God. You want to, you want to know who God is. Well, here it is. You know, Bob says this all the time, and, and, and this is something that stuck with me, and, and I, I search it myself, and, and it's actually, not, not, not right now, but before, when I heard it the first time, when Bob, he was saying, he said that, you know, God only dwells in, in his throne and with humble people. 
And this is very true. Look at what it says in verse 15. I'm going to say like Bob said, hey, I think we're going to go over, but who cares? Look at 57 verse 15. It says, Isaiah 57 verse 15. For thou says the high and lofty one who inhabit eternity, who name is holy. I dwell in high and holy places. Where did, that, where did God dwell? High and holy places. But look at what it says. With him who has contrite and humble spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the country ones. Where did God dwell? In high places, holy places. Where else? In a humble person. In a humble person. This is where God dwells. 